Great. Off we go. Welcome, everybody, to our breath coach training. Really excited to have all of you here. This is day one, and we've got a whole bunch of things to get into right away. Before we jump into the course, before we jump into nuts and bolts and administrative stuff, let's just pause for a moment and let me rewind the clock and set the stage for why I do this, because each of you needs to figure out your motivation and your end goal. I started practicing yoga back in 2002 in New York City. I used to live in New York City before I ran away. And I got excited about all things yoga. Every style of yoga I could practice, every teacher of yoga, every studio. I literally went all around lower Manhattan and into Brooklyn, practicing every style of yoga that I could discover. And every yoga class I went to, every single teacher said, breath, breath, focus on the breath, breathe slowly, breathe deeply. Uh, you know, breath is life, breath is prana. All, all these things that we've all heard before. And I, okay, great, okay, great. And I'd go up and I'd ask my teacher, I'd say, hey, Reggie, uh, like this breathing thing, like how fast should I breathe? He just said, slowly. Said, okay. I said, hey, Raphael, how, how deeply should I breathe? As deep as you can. I just thought, okay. And I just kept asking people, kept asking people. And I kept getting these really general answers. Like, hey, try this Nadi Shodana practice. Hey, try this Kapalabhati practice. And there was a lot of practices, a lot of emphasis on the breath and very little understanding. And I got really frustrated. I have this very left brain. I think some of you are familiar with my work. I have a very pragmatic brain. And when things don't kind of fall into their grooves, I feel this open loop that needs to be resolved. And so I went on this journey to really try to understand breath and, and learn breath and figure out how it works. And it took me a really, really long time to land on something very simple. I started teaching breath uh, in yoga classes and then eventually in teacher training courses and things, I guess right, right away from the early days. But by 2006, I was teaching it as part of yoga teacher training programs and uh, doing very in-depth modules with breath and PowerPoints and all this complicated stuff. And uh, I was so, so excited about it. But for so many years, my students were excited. I was excited, but none of it really landed. None of it, none of it stuck. And what I mean by that is people would be super pumped, super excited about yoga breathing. And then, you know, a month after the course, I'd be in touch with people. Hey, you still doing your breathing? No, you know, I forgot. Like, how does it work? Like, why am I doing this? And I realized this complexity, this generalization about the breath that I had loathed so much, I had begun to teach myself. And so I went through this process of distilling down, uncovering, researching, and it really, it really had to do with leaving the yoga world and talking to people in exercise physiology, talking to people who work with asthma, talking to people who work with athletes. And like all beautiful things in life, the end result is very simple. <laughs> I went on this uh, podcast tour, I guess it was probably about three years ago, and I was on something like 50 or 75 podcasts or something. And everybody just wanted to talk about breathing. And so I kept talking about breathing. I kept talking about breathing. I kept getting less and less and less time. You know, first I would have an hour and then I'd have 30 minutes and then I'd have 15 minutes. I was on some weird radio show and I had five minutes. And as I went through that process, I tried to think of how can I teach this person listening in the car who's never heard of yoga or breathing before? How can I teach them something that actually has value in their life? How could I deliver a message that's simple enough, but it's, it's not bastardizing the practice. There's still power there. And this is where uh, we landed on this water whiskey concept, which will be a guiding principle throughout the course. Most of you have seen the TEDx talk that I did. And I, I did this TEDx talk. I was so excited. I thought, okay, finally, I've got this simple breathing methodology. Everyone's going to love it. And I did this TEDx talk. And it was like crickets for a year. I think there was like 1,000 people had seen the talk. I thought, oh, I'm a failure. And then something happened. People got interested in breathing. Things got passed around. And they were like, okay, I'm on to something. I think it's at 1.6 or 1.8 million views or something like that. And it's not so much that I'm excited about 1.8 million views. What I'm really excited about is there's that many yoga nerds out there who are interested enough in breathing to watch me blab on about it for 10 minutes. And so from all of that work, that's where this course has been born. Um, I, like, you know, like I said, I've been teaching yoga breathing professionally in training settings since like 2006-ish. But this current iteration, I'm convinced is, well, I have evidence of, you know, we have hundreds of graduates now. I have evidence that it's much more powerful much more effective and really provides a service to your clients. It's very easy in the world of mind, body, wellness, meditation, alternative health to get lost in complexity. And things are all so exciting and so positive and yet not always that practical. This approach that we're, that I'll lead you through is hyper practical. In fact, sometimes it's so practical, you'll think, Lucas, can we just like lie on the floor and zone out for a little bit? It's extremely focused on your client's results. 
as I mentioned in the post in Telegram yesterday, this particular course has just one focus, help our clients manage their nervous system. And if you keep that in mind, all of the work we're doing, the practice teaching, the practices, the simplicity, the anatomy, the physiology, understanding all the science, the O2, CO2 exchange, all of it will start to make sense. Our main goal here is to help our clients manage their nervous systems. Full stop, that's it. There's lots of other yoga breathing out there that has other purposes. There's, there's yoga breathing practices that are designed to release trauma. There's yoga breathing practices that are designed to take you to an ethereal out of body experience. Cool, that's not what we're doing here. Those practices have their place. What we're doing here is one single pointed goal is to help our clients balance their nervous systems, help them get control over their nervous systems. And what you'll find is as a teacher, as a service provider, as eventually as a business person, as a coach, this is where the most value is. Things like experiential classes, we go to once a year, once in a lifetime, once every couple of years. But when we talk about a class that helps us balance our nervous system, this is something that we can really serve our clients with long-term. From a practical standpoint, from a problem-solving standpoint, from a need and service-based provider standpoint, this approach is really, really practical. So that's what we'll get into here. Okay, let's take a step back and chat about logistics. We're here for 12 days together. We go live uh, at this time pretty much every day. On the weekend, on uh, Saturday and Sunday, I usually change the time to try to catch some of our, our students who are in Southeast Asia, Australia, Japan. And But most days, I'll let you know in advance, but most days we're live at this exact same time. Time zones are all funny. Please don't email or post in the Telegram group. Just either Google search, what time is it in Barcelona? And you can match up. Or I like world timebuddy.com. It's a really simple website. I think I use it every single day to try to figure out what time zones are. And so we're live. Uh, there's my clock back there. We're live at uh, 3 p.m. Barcelona time all the way through Friday. Saturday, Sunday will change for the for our folks who are way far away from us. But uh, the following week will be live at the same time. So we go all the way through for 12 days and we'll meet every day here for about an hour and then I'll do Q&A separately. But I'll let you know when I'm doing the Q&A so that those of you who need to bounce can bounce and you can catch the Q&A or not. I would like to mention that some of you have already made your way through the e-learning center, amazing. Some of you have done the entire course already, also amazing. A lot of people say, Lucas, you're talking about the same things and this is true. All of what I'll be chatting about is covered in the e-learning center. We started incorporating live elements into pretty much everything we do because we find people learn better that way. I find I learn better that way. It also gives us an opportunity to add in new research, answer questions on the fly. We're, we're always growing and adapting all of our courses and the live element really adds to that. The reason I mention this is because for those of you who are unable or you feel like you've already done it, all of these tools are just here for you to pull from. We have 12 days, 12 modules, and you work through them however works for you. Join me live if you can. It's great to have you guys here. I see we've got a bunch of people here. If you're unable to join live, the replay is available the same day, usually within about an hour. Sometimes it takes a little while for the video to render, but very, very quickly, the replay is available. The Telegram group is there just for reminders. You'll see like uh, 15 minutes ago, we posted the, the link to the Zoom class. The Zoom link is actually the same all day, every day. The replay link I'll also post every day, but it's also the same one every single day. Everything stays the same. We try to keep it really simple. The Q&A form is the same every day as well. But again, we just post these things to keep it simple and because it comes to your phone. In Telegram, I know some of you are new to Telegram, there's two different channels. One has a little bell icon, that's my channel. And I'll keep it really clean, which means I delete, I edit, I add things. It's always very linear and simple. It'll be very easy to navigate. The second one is the chat. And the chat has a little talk bubble. And that one is not clean. That one is a free-for-all where you guys can connect with each other. You can share photos of your practice spaces. You can share questions and resources with each other. It's a place for you guys to connect. If the chat gets overwhelming, you can mute it. You can bail out too. You can even bail out from all of Telegram if it's just too much for you. This isn't like a tech test or anything like that. Um, all of these tools are just here to help you. And again, as the course has grown, we found that this is a really, really simple way to communicate. I know a bunch of you have done our other courses and you are familiar with Telegram. So you can point people in the right direction. How it rolls out here is we'll do an hour uh, a day and we'll start off all of our days with a practice. We'll jump into a lecture and then we'll finish with practice teaching. How practice teaching goes is I'll, I'll shoot you off into little breakout rooms. Don't worry about it. You don't have to actually do anything. And you'll be with two or four other people and you'll practice today's lesson 
speaking directly into your phone or your computer so you can get on the ground experience, which is absolutely crucial. There's a whole lot of people out there teaching breathing, but not a lot of people teaching the how or the why. There's just a lot of what. And by what, I mean, they're doing this kind of breath or that kind of breath or XYZ breath or Acme breath. And they have all these different brand names and things. But the question is why and how, meaning what are the actual techniques that are involved? Is it diaphragmatic? Are we breathing with our accessory muscles? Are, are we breathing? What kind of rate? What kind of volume? And, and then the why. Why on earth are we hyperventilating before bed? I don't know, but a lot of people are doing that, right? And so it's really important that it's not just about collecting practices and putting them in your pocket. It's about understanding the why. Why on earth are we doing this in the first place? And then the how exactly the mechanics of the practice. And that's how things work. So we'll finish up the course 12 days from today. We finish up on a Friday and the following Sunday. So two days after that Friday is when everything is due. I think it's the 20th of December. It's due at midnight, your time. Whose time? Your time. What day? Sunday. Whose day? Yet Sunday, your time. Wherever you live in the world. I'm saying that because people are going to ask, whose time? What time? They always, everybody gets, uh, you know, dog ate the homework excuses that come in really quickly. We have firm deadlines on our courses for two reasons. Um, one reason is we found that more time does not equal better quality. In fact, the opposite is true. And so we found that this positive pressure, just like in university, just like in school, really helps people to accelerate. The other reason is just straight up logistics. My team and I, we go from course to course to course. And when we're in a course, we are in the course. And when our head, when we're head down in a course, we just want to focus on one course at a time. And that that's why we, we need to move on to other courses. So everything is due Sunday at midnight, your time. Don't worry about the exam yet. I'll walk you through it. I'll post another video in the Telegram group to walk you through exactly how it works. You'll do just fine if you follow along. I would encourage you to wait to do the online quizzes and things until Monday, so a week from today, because we'll cover just about everything in terms of nervous system and CO2 and O2. And I also put little quizzes in the Telegram group just for fun every day to reinforce learning. So if you wait till like Monday or Tuesday of next week, the online quizzes, you'll just blast right through them. You'll have all this stuff second nature. If you try to do it today, you'll, you'll have to do a lot of page turning digital page training and things like that to get through the program. Everything that we do from the quizzes to your final assignment, everything is in service of you actually getting out there and teaching and coaching. And, and so none of it is just an academic exercise. Just to give you a little bit of reference, we have teachers in, uh, I don't know, at least 18 different countries as breath coaches right now. And they are working, many of them have incorporated into a yoga teaching practice, meditation, teaching setting, uh, 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 traditional therapy, talk therapy, counseling setting. We have people who are teaching breathing standalone in CrossFit boxes and, and PT centers. We have people who are teaching breathing in corporate centers, which is getting more and more popular. There's more opportunities than ever before. Homework, COVID, coronavirus has just actually exploded the opportunity because more people are suffering from nervous system dysregulation than ever before. And they don't have access to the normal places they would go to like gyms or fitness centers or therapists or coaches. It's working great. Now's a great time. We'll walk you through every step of the way. Let's jump into class and then we'll come back to questions later on. Let's begin with a practice. I'll post later on uh, some little visual diagrams for you to think about with clients. But the first thing to remember is that there is no such thing as perfect posture, not for meditation, not for yoga, and certainly not for breathing. So you use whatever posture works for you. You can see I've got this little setup back here just to give you a, a little reference. What could we do? Well, we could sit cross-legged, totally fine. My hips are relatively open, so this is very comfortable for me. For most of your clients, it won't be. And so they could sit on a block or another block to get up higher. Maybe a pillow is more comfortable. What we're aiming for when we block up is to get our knees more or less in line with our hips. This is a circulation thing. When my knees are up here, they'll start to tingle and fall asleep and my lower back will hurt. As I'm going up, I'm just trying to get my knees in line. Now, if we're at two, three blocks and it's still not working, sit in a chair, sit in a stool, but sit on the edge of the chair or the stool so your back is not into the stool, totally, totally fine. We'll also be practicing supine poses and many of the poses can be done supine on your back. And there is absolutely nothing beginner or advanced about sitting in a chair or sitting on the floor, or taking lotus pose. 
it doesn't change anything. <laughs> it's equally hard to sit focused on a chair as it is to sit on the floor. In fact, maybe it's harder to sit focused on a chair. We'll begin with Breath of Fire, which is a practice that you guys did this morning. So if you can, if you guys can, just step away from your, your laptop, your computer. If you need to, just sit down on the floor, even if you go off camera, don't worry. Some of you have camera on, some camera off, don't, don't worry about it. Take a seat on the floor, cross your legs or take a seat on a chair and move your bum away from the back of the chair and place your hands on your knees. Here's the deal with Breath of Fire. This is actually a Kriya practice. I'm showing you from the side because I want you to relax your belly completely. In order to do that, very often we need to slightly slouch our back. Lucas, you're not sitting up straight. Well, I could, but when I do that, I engage my core a little bit and the breathing practice doesn't work. So instead we'll slightly slouch just a little bit. This practice called Breath of Fire or Kapalabhati breath in Sanskrit, these Sanskrit names are, are, I haven't found them to be very useful. So I just use the English or whatever language you're teaching in Spanish with a different set of vocab, obviously. Uh, this practice originally comes, it was first codified in the Hatha Pradipika, which was kind of the first yoga book. And it's actually a Kriya, a cleansing practice. And it's a weird one because it's a totally backwards way of breathing. What do I mean by that? That means when we exhale, we do it forcibly and we don't use our normal breathing muscles, we use our abdominal muscles. And the way to think about it is imagine someone kicked a football and it came right into your stomach and you go, and then you relax, and then you relax. You only exhale. The inhale happens all on its own. Lucas, but if I don't inhale, I'm gonna die. People always say, you won't die. Your breath is going to come back in all by itself, right? When you hold your breath and you go swimming in the pool and you pop up, you breathe in your breath will come in by itself because we're forcing it out and we're creating a vacuum. The rhythm is really important. It's a slow, steady, exhale, exhale, exhale. About a breath a second, a little bit faster for most people, but not slower and definitely not like this or you'll get all buzzed out and you won't have time to inhale. So let me show you what it looks like. My belly's relaxed, my face, my shoulders, my chest is relaxed. And I make a sharp exhale through my nose like a sneeze, as if that football <laughs> comes right into my gut. I'm doing my best to keep my face relaxed. It doesn't work, right? My big old nostrils are flaring in this guy, but I'm trying my best to relax my face, trying my best to relax my chest as well. I'm trying to make all the work happen down here. It's hard, it's unusual, it's a weird way to breathe. Nobody does this well right out of the gate. In fact, many people have been teaching this for years and they also don't do it well, they've never analyzed it. It's a funky, weird breathing practice. We're using our abdominal muscles to squish our abdominal cavity and force the breath out and then the breath comes back in. As I mentioned this morning, when we did this practice, it's a stimulating practice. It cranks up your sympathetic nervous system, your, your fight or flight response. What I mentioned earlier is a lot of people are doing this right before bed. That's a terrible idea, right? You wouldn't wanna do this right before bed. We do these kinds of practices in the morning or before exercise. Let me show you one more time and then we'll practice together. Soften my posture a little bit. It's really, really important. I often grab my belly too, just to make sure it's relaxed. And then it's a sharp shooting, Good, and we usually do 20 rounds, and we usually practice three rounds of 20. Let's practice one round together, we'll jump into today's class. Hands are on your knees, sit up tall, and now deliberately relax a little bit. If you don't, I promise you, you'll sit up too tall. We all try to do this like impressive yogi stance. Soften your shoulders a little bit, okay? Chin parallel to the floor. Now here's the tough part. Face relaxed, shoulders relaxed, chest relaxed as much as possible. All the energy comes from the lower abdomen, which squeezes as you exhale, squeezes as you exhale, and the inhale happens all on its own. Let's begin together. Three, two, one. We exhale, 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 exhale. In five, four, three, two, one. Eyes closed, body relaxed, breath is normal. In the first round, you might not feel that, but by the second or third round, you'll often feel a little bit of tingling. We'll explain what's going on there in the next couple of days. And you might feel a little bit buzzy, almost like you get a little charge of energy. 
Breath of Fire is a coffee category practice. Those practices go in the morning or before physical exercise. We don't really use them at other times. In the morning, first thing is the best, or right before physical exercise to get our body ready for a yoga class, a run, a CrossFit workout, or whatever it might be. Okay, let's jump in and we'll get right into our class today, which is the science of breathing. We'll come back and we'll practice breath of fire in groups of two to four at the end of class, just to give you a little reference. This is kind of how we make things work. Let me jump in here. Okay, science of breathing, understanding the mind-body connection. And again, what we're really focusing on in this course is the why and the how. The what is easy. You can go buy a book, Light on Pranayama or any of these old school Pranayama books and get 300 different practices. Who cares, right? You can also get 300 different yoga poses. Who cares? It's just a list of poses. I'm not saying it's not interesting. I have those books, right? I read through those. But the most important thing is why and how. Because if you don't know the why of the practice, you're just throwing random stuff at the wall and inevitably you'll get things scrambled. You'll put yourself to sleep in the morning. You'll get yourself buzzing in the evening. You'll throw off your nervous system all wonky when you wanna calm down. It's very easy to do with the breath. So we need to focus on the why and the how. The why is the actual reason why we'd be doing it in the first place. And the how is the actual mechanical things. How does this thing work? Let's define breathing. I like to try to define all the things that we work with Essentially, it's this biological function of, of taking in air, absorbing oxygen, and then exhaling air and releasing carbon dioxide. There's more to it than that, and it affects us on a very deep level, but this is essentially what's going on and what we'll be chatting about today. The key thing with breathing that we need to remember is that breathing is not just about oxygen. It's, it, CO2 is extremely important. I'm gonna get these t-shirts made that say, I love CO2 because every breathing person, even some of the smartest breathing guys out there who write really great books and stuff, they slip up and they get focused on oxygen and they think it's all about oxygen. This is about a balance and exchange. If oxygen was really the source of life, if oxygen was all we need, you can go buy a tank of it. You could just sit there and go, right? That's not that's not all that we need. It's a complex interplay. It's very similar to people who look at exercise and they just say, hey, Lucas, your, your yoga classes look awesome. How many calories does it burn? How much fat does it burn? It's like, I could tell you that, but that's, that, that's just one piece of the puzzle. That's not the, you, you, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You, you, you're, sorry, you're too tightly focused on just one thing. That's one piece of a big complex series. And this is the same thing with oxygen. Yes, oxygen is important. Yes, oxygen is the source of life, but oxygen is really pretty easy to come by. There's a lot of it around. There's a lot of it in the air that we're breathing. We don't even need most of that. And we could certainly just go buy a tank of it if that was really the, the secret to health. That's not what it is. There's not a whole bunch of people walking around oxygen deprived. Here's our agenda for today. We'll talk about respiration, what's actually going on. We'll talk about the muscles of breath, muscles of breathing, and we'll come back to this quite a few times throughout the course. We'll talk about the organs of breathing, which are your lungs, of course, and then gas exchange, which is this simple but very, very crucial O2 CO2 exchange. So what happens when we breathe in? Well, the, the breath is coming in through your nose or your mouth. Of course, we can breathe through our mouth, but for most of our practices, we'll focus on nose, nose breathing. We'll get to that a little later. Um, then of course, the, the breath comes into your pharynx, your trachea, your bronchi, your lungs, your bronchioles. And probably most interesting is just to think about this sort of like, uh, and uh, think about it like an anthill. And as the breath goes down, the anthill gets narrower and narrower and narrower. And imagine instead of a, an ant that's this big, it's a teeny, 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 tiny ant holes going down, 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 down. And we have these alveoli, which are interesting in that there are so many of them. The surface area of your lungs, where you to pull it out is something like almost as big as a tennis court, right? It's huge, huge surface. And these alveoli are largely responsible for that. We'll get into more of this later, but it's important to understand that this subtle, uh, there's a real subtleness to the, the lungs. There's a very, very small physiology that isn't present in other areas of the body that become important when we think about uh, respiration in general. The muscles of breathing are really important to understand. It's especially important to understand when we start to think about the why and the how. The how of breath of fire, we just breathe with our non-breathing muscles, right? We just manually breathed ourselves. 
if you were lying on the floor and a, a CPR, uh, a medic came over to you and he or she manually had you breathe, what would they do? I, don't, I know a bunch of you had CPR training, I'm sure. They put their hands in, you know, one, two, three, that would breathe you, but you're not using your muscles. You're not using your respiratory muscles. You're being breathed externally. You might have, uh, you might be on a ventilator, a respirator. Uh, you might just be squished, right? Maybe some, you maybe you're eight years old and you're playing in the playground. Some kid dog pile you and you, you know, your breath comes out. What we just did there with Breath of Fire, we didn't use our breathing muscles. We were breathing in a very unusual way. And let's take a look at what breathing muscles actually look like. You have your diaphragm, which I like to think of as a jellyfish. And the reason I like to think about it as a jellyfish is because that jellyfish contracts down and relaxes up, contracts down and relaxes up. We then have our intercostal muscles and then our accessory muscles. We'll take a look at this later on with skeletons and we'll look at some 3D videos and things like that. But essentially, if you take your hands and put them right where your, your lowest rib is and then dig your fingers in there, it's really not comfortable, but dig your fingers in there. It's up much higher than you think. That's where your diaphragm is. And again, we'll take a look at some 3D render videos and things like this, but dig your fingers way up in there. That's your jellyfish diaphragm. This is your main muscle of breathing. And again, the reason I call it a jellyfish is because it contracts down like a jellyfish swimming and relaxes up, contracts down, creates a volume, uh, creates a vacuum and relaxes up. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, active, exhale, passive. Inhale, contracts, exhale, relax. Number one, diaphragm. Big, big, important breathing muscle. A lot of us have weak and tight diaphragms, just like a lot of muscles in the body get weak and tight. Your breathing muscles can get weak as well. You can get stronger breathing muscles from breathing practice. This is good. What's next? Take your fingers and dig them in between your ribs. If you've ever seen, like, if you've ever been to like a Texas barbecue, I have not, but so I have heard that I've only been to Texas a few times. Texas barbecue, I think they have baby back ribs and baby back ribs would be made with pork or beef, I think usually pork, but that is muscle and a whole bunch of fat. Those are your intercostal muscles, right? You can push between there. And what can I do with my intercostal muscles? Well, check it out. <laughs> I can puff up my chest, right? And so when those muscles contract, I also create more space. So that's phase number two, you have a three phase yogic breath. What's the last part? Well, they're called your accessory muscles because they're not main breathing muscles, but they're accessory muscles. The muscles of my chest, my shoulders, my upper back, because I can, right? I can pull in a little bit more air there too as well. Each of these areas is associated with a different nervous system state. What do I mean by that? Well, let's imagine you walked into the, the grocery store and there's somebody at the counter going, that make you pretty nervous, right? <laughs> let's imagine you walked into a, um, a, a, I don't know, there was a car accident. You see somebody sitting over on the side and they're relaxed and their belly, their belly's sticking out and they're breathing deep into their belly and you go, hmm. That's peculiar. What you're noticing is someone's breathing pattern, which is giving you insight into their nervous system, which is kind of the whole Pandora's box here of what we're looking for. How you breathe is how you feel, how you breathe is uh, how you feel is how you breathe. And this very interesting interchange is what we'll be manipulating and playing with throughout the course. So three main areas we breathe, jellyfish muscle, our diaphragm, very, very important our intercostal muscles, we can breathe by contracting those rib cage muscles, and then our accessory muscles of our chest and upper back. It's kind of a full three phase yogic breath. We would use all three of those. We would focus of course on our diaphragm. And in some cases like tonight's practice before you go to bed, we'll use purely diaphragm or as, as pure as we can diaphragmatic breath. Um, let's think about our lungs specifically. Again, I really encourage you to palpate your own body. I know it seems a little bit silly, but this concept that we're, we're trying to promote is called interoception. And what that means is just, uh, just understanding your own, uh, your own body on the inside, understanding your feelings, being aware of what's going on. And I find it very, very helpful to palpate your own body. So if you take your right hand and cover your right side, our right lung, that lobe is bigger. We have three lobes over there. And then on the left side, it's smaller with just two lobes. Just kind of a fun fact, but you know, they're not symmetrical. It's important to remember your lungs are not symmetrical. Um, men have a larger lung capacity than women. This is for all intents and purposes, irrelevant. It's just a fun fact. What do I mean by it's irrelevant? Uh, it means that a woman free diver, a uh, uh, woman athlete, it, it seems like it's just 
it, it just is what it is. It, and it doesn't seem like it's any kind of relevance in terms of breathing performance. Um, if anything, women actually seem to have some advantages when it comes to breathing because of their body composition and things like that. Um, muscle mass is actually an oxygen hog when it comes to things like diving and things like this. But it is important to, to understand that men have a larger lung capacity, just like women have larger hips than men. Um, uh, it is possible to increase your lung capacity through exercise, through training and things like that. But keep in mind, what we're usually talking about for most people is about five to 15%. So let's just pick a median number in the middle, 10%. That's very significant to increase your lung capacity 10%. That is significant, but we're not going to double your lung capacity. That's not going to happen, right? A 10% bump would be very significant. But I just mentioned that because sometimes people get a little carried away with this idea that they're gonna double their lung capacity and they're gonna go from six liters to 12 liters. This isn't going to happen. There are human anomalies where people just have massive lung capacities totally exists. There are people who are born with abnormally small or impaired breathing capacities as well too. And within those groups, there might be some bigger range, but for the most part, we can definitely increase our lung capacity. But again, the name of the game is not so much about lung capacity as it is respiratory health, breath coordination, breath awareness, conscious breathing, these kinds of things. Okay, let's imagine we breathe in dry air. Dry air and moist air are different. And when people say, I like dry air or I like humidity, maybe they're referencing this. I don't know, it's just kind of an interesting th th thing to think about. But essentially, I like to think of 80-20 just to keep it simple in my head, just to get you more or less. It's not exactly 80-20, but gives you a little bit of a, a little, gives you a little bit of um, reference. So in, in ambient air, in dry air, like right now the air is pretty dry. It's, it's winter-ish here, which is kind of a fake winter. We have 78% uh, nitrogen. So most air is nitrogen. And just as a little fun fact, when they do like packaged foods, they'll often do a nitrogen flush, which means they get rid of all the oxygen so no bugs can grow. You get pure nitrogen in there. And something like a protein bar, a granola snack bar, a bag of crisps is gonna last a lot longer without that oxygen. And about 21-ish percent oxygen. So, okay, so my ambient air, immediately when people see that, oh, we need more oxygen. We need, we need to get a lot more oxygen. No, you don't. <laughs> it's enough. Pure oxygen is not hard to come by, right? We could all go buy a tank. We could all stick it next to our bed. That's not the goal here. It, it's not the goal. We want a proper balance. And this is something we'll come back to again and again, but balance is really what we're looking for. There's some other stuff in there too. When you inhale some air, there's some argon, there's some carbon dioxide, just ambient carbon dioxide. All of us are familiar with carbon emissions, right? This is an ongoing issue in the world in different areas more so than others. And there's traces of other gases as well too. But basically, basically we've got nitrogen, oxygen, and a little bit of CO2. And, um, and if we have, the moist air that we exhale, here's where it gets interesting, right? We're, we're still going to exhale quite a bit of oxygen. So we don't need all of this oxygen that we've inhaled. We just need a little bit. And so this is why, like my family lives, at Den lives in Denver. I think Denver's like 5,000 feet or something, right? I used to spend summers at 10 and a half thousand feet, uh, which is like three, three point two. I don't know, 3,200 meters, 3,400 meters, something like that. And uh, you're, you can totally do it. Is there a lot less oxygen? Yeah, there's a lot less oxygen. But again, the name of the game, we're not just oxygen hunters. We're not out, just there, there's oxygen there. We're looking for balance. Here's the deal though. Let me flip back and you can see what happened here. Look at that CO2, it's bullet number four. We went from 0 0.04, right, 0 0.04, and we went to like four or 5% CO2. So there's a lot of CO2 coming out. And immediately what people say is, oh, this is great. Get rid of that toxic CO2. And yeah, we need to get rid of, to we need to get rid of CO2 for sure. But to, to vilify it and call it a toxin is a huge, huge misnomer. We'll get a lot more into this. You also get rid of some water vapor. This is important because when you exercise a lot, you, you breathe off water. And, um, and so you can start to get dehydrated. So think about 80, 20, and then you can adjust it a little bit, meaning 80, 20, it's 80-ish it's percent uh, nitrogen, 20-ish percent oxygen, a little bit of CO2 and a little bit of other gases. And that gives you a general idea. But on the exhale, the thing that's gonna vary really, really dramatically is the levels of CO2 and oxygen that come back out. And this is what we'll mostly be manipulating. So what is oxygen's role? Oxygen, of course, is 
it's crucial. It's absolutely important, right? It's essential for every cell in your body. Um, you know, this is how food is changed into energy. It's, it helps with muscle contractions. It repairs your cells. It feeds your brain. It, it, it cleanses your body. But again, it's not a question of quantity. It's really a question of balance. If all we needed was more of it, we would just order it on Amazon and suck on oxygen tank. That's not the solution. Here's the one that nobody pays any attention to and we need to, which is CO2. And why doesn't anybody pay attention to it? Because it's thought of as a toxic, thought of as a toxin. And sometimes I like to give the analogy of from different modalities. If you look at food, in food, dietary fat is often vilified. And people think fat is bad, fat is on my hips, fat will give me heart disease. And those things aren't wrong, but they're also not right. Dietary fat, the right kinds of dietary fat is some of the healthiest food you can eat. CO2, the right level optimized CO2, is one of the healthiest things you can do for your respiratory system. So what does CO2 do? It does some very interesting things. And one of the things that it does is called vasodilation. And vasodilation means the, the veins in my body open up, right? It also is a bronchodilator. What does that mean? It means my breathing passageways, including my nose, a bunch of you have said, my nose is super blocked. It also helps to open it up. How many people have obstructive breathing? tens of millions, if not over, maybe over a billion. It's absolutely everywhere. Obstructive breathing, allergies, deviated septa, uh, everywhere, right? So more CO2 means opening up of those breathing passageways. Here's where it gets a little bit weird. CO2 helps you to absorb O2. And this is where, this is where people get really lost in the weeds is they don't realize that this CO2 is absolutely crucial for absorbing your oxygen. The analogy that I often use is like, uh, if any of you have been anemic or know somebody who's been anemic, I've never had problems with anemia, but I have uh, uh, one relative and two friends who've had troubles with anemia. And when they go to the doctor, the doctor, yes, gives them iron, but very often focuses on optimizing B12 levels, different B, B complex vitamins levels, because those are cofactors for absorption. The same is true, we'll get deeper into the Bohr effect later, but in order to actually absorb O2, you need CO2. And this is the bigger problem. Not that there's not, not, that there's not enough O2, there's plenty of O2 in this room for me to be here all day. The problem is, am I actually absorbing it? And this is where we get into trouble. Um, and of course, CO2 does help you, uh, it does help you get rid of waste as well too. So the, what we're really looking for is a good balance here. And this, uh, the, the analogy I always use is like a yin yang symbol as cliche and overused as, as trite as it is. It's really, really true. This is what we're looking for, balance. We need oxygen, oxygen is good. We need a carbon dioxide that's also good. And the proper exchange is what we're looking for. Okay, so that's really general, Lucas. What are we talking about? Well, what we're talking about is most people, most of the time, breathe too fast. Most people, most of the time, breathe too high. So they're breathing mostly up here with their intercostal and their accessory muscles, and they're breathing too quickly, which means they're getting plenty, plenty, plenty of oxygen, but not enough CO2, which means they're tweaking out their nervous system. They have vasal constriction, bronchial constriction, and a whole bunch of other challenges that come up. In a nutshell, this is what's going on. If you walk on the street, you go in the store, wherever, you'll mostly find people who are breathing too fast and too high, too fast and too high. The majority of what we're doing with yoga breathing is trying to normalize things, trying to get back to a healthy exchange between the two. And we'll really define that in a very clear way. So we'll get a lot deeper into the Bohr effect. We'll talk about the nasal cycle. We're gonna get a lot more into ex the, the, the actual physiology of breath as the days go on. But your key learning from today, the takeaway is number one is that breathing is complex and dynamic. This is not a course about oxygen. Most of you, almost all of you, if we were to put a blood oximeter, I have one here, I'll show you tomorrow. If we were to put a blood oximeter on you, most of you have perfect blood oxygen, 95, 97, 99% blood oxygen saturation. That's not the issue. If we go on the street, even there's a whole bunch of college kids out here smoking right now, even their blood oxygen level, it's totally fine. That's not the issue here. The issue here is balance, nervous system balance. And remember our core goal with this program is to help our clients balance their nervous system. And that is not about pumping them full of oxygen. Most of them have access to that 21-ish percent oxygen floating around in the air all the time. They just need to learn how to capture it in a way that doesn't tweak out their body. Nose is for breathing and mouth is for eating. This is a good axiom. 
We break this rule in yoga. We break this rule in Pilates. We break this rule when we go running. We break this rule in gravity yoga. But for most intents and purposes, nose is for breathing and mouth is for eating. With clients who have obstructive breathing, we also break this rule. We'll get into this because I know some of you are dealing with that as well too. And if you are, if you have a deviated septum, if you have chronic allergies, if you just have obstructive breathing, please don't think there's anything broken about you. There's just different people. In the same way people have different spines, people have different breathing passageways. There are absolutely ways to work around it and we'll get into it. O2 and CO2 are really important. Yoga breathing doesn't matter what brand you're talking about, whether you're talking about Iyengar, Wim Hof, or Buteyko, or, or it, it doesn't matter. The main thing you're doing is manipulating CO2. That's the main thing you're doing. And by affecting CO2, that's mainly what you're playing with. And that's why I want to get these. Someday I'll get, I'll get them soon, I promise. I love CO2 shirts because mostly what we're doing with yoga breathing is CO2. And mostly what people are focusing on is O2. The O2 is part of the equation. Of course, it's crucial. Of course, it's a high leverage point but it's not where we should be putting our focus because that's not the main mechanism of action. Remember, there's a lot of practices that will show you what to do, just throw things at the wall. We wanna focus on the why we're doing it and specifically how, so that the results are there, so that people help get control over their nervous system. Um, here's what happens next, guys. I'm gonna split you off into rooms. And so for those of you who are at work and you're watching this and you're supposed to be working, or for those of you who are unable to do practice teaching, now would be a time to sign off. For the next 15-ish minutes, I'll put you into breakout rooms. You don't have to do anything, I'll just throw you in there. When you get into the breakout room, you'll have somewhere between two and four partners. And here's what you say to your partners. Hey, it's Lucas, I'm in Barcelona. Let me do breath of fire, I'll teach you first. I'll do one round of 20. And then you go, and then you go, and then you go. You'll be tempted to do big, long intros. Please connect with each other offline. Well, online, but outside of the, the lecture, just so you have enough time to practice. You'll get to know each other a lot better. When I put you in a breakout room, again, just unmute yourself. Hey, it's Lucas. I'm in Barcelona. Let me go first. I'll do 20 rounds of Breath of Fire. Teach your student, and then you switch and switch and switch. This is a hard one to teach, and right away, you're going to be confronted with the fact that clapping is... Snapping is awkward and counting is difficult and keeping the rhythm is awkward. This is totally fine. Let's stumble through this together. Let's find your way together. I can't tell you how many people have been teaching yoga for a million years and they try to teach breath of fire and they go all sideways with the counting. Don't worry, we all do it. Just stumble through it and this process is how you'll learn. So I'll pop you into groups. If you get stuck in a group with nobody there, raise your hand and I'll come and find you. And then we'll all come back before we jump into Q&A. Give me just one second. <clears throat> 